check it out guys. I've got all of my stuff ready to go for powder coat. We've got the blaster frame right there and all the other parts I've got organized in boxes. Here's our wheels, swing arm. You can see I have gunmetal on the box. That's not the actual color name. Um, I still have to pick the color out when I go to Bonehead, but it's basically going to be a gunmetal color. Uh, got a box of blackjack. That is the actual color. That's one of my favorite colors that they make there. We've got the steering stem in there, uh, skid plate, just some basic stuff. And then I've got mini texture black. This is one of my favorite colors. When this stuff comes back, I'll show you a little bit more, but mini texture actually kind of has, it's like, um, it has a texture to it and it's like grippy, but it's not so textured that it picks up lint and stuff when you're cleaning it off. Awesome color. We've got our rear spring, rear carrier. They're going to be gold. Um, front hubs, I'm not 100% sure on. We've got the front springs. They're going to be white. And that's pretty much it, man. There's not that much stuff. You guys may notice that the A-arms aren't here. That's because they are with Moto Blast. Um, I'm just having those blasted and cleaned. And then I'm going to paint those because there are plastic bushings inside the OEM A-arms from what I understand. And if you get them vapor blasted, uh, they melt. You have a good chance that they'll melt anyways, so I'm not gonna risk it. Um, we'll just paint them. All right, now I've got these parts cleaned up for the most part. They're not like sparkling clean, but I don't like to give them super dirty parts, even though they said that's okay. I don't think anybody likes receiving dirty parts to work on. And the reason I've got the Wildcat Banshee in the back is because the one time I was at Bonehead, the owner told me he never gets to see any of the finished products of the stuff that he powder coats. And he seemed kind of sad when he said it. <laughs> so <laughs> this is getting ready to go back to Wildcat. So before I bring it back, I'm just gonna bring it over so that they can see it in person. Load the rest of this stuff up and then we'll get to working on the Lakota, I promise. I love this thing. We gotta turn this thing into a savage beast. We got some couple little fixes we gotta do and some modifications. Now this thing runs great as is, it really does. If you guys remember in the video where I purchased this thing, it was a blast, man. We were ripping around in the field and it actually has some pretty decent power. I'm not gonna lie, it's got enough that you can have a good time. Oh shit! <laughs> I almost went all the way back. But since then I haven't done anything to this thing. I did take it up to the Poconos. I was riding with the Brewers. We had a uh, some 250 EXs up there. We put them head to head. I'm not gonna give you the results, but uh, it was it was kind of surprising, honestly, but we had a great time with it. Now, as far as this machine goes, it is completely stock as far as I know, uh, even down to the original tires. We've got some new tires right here. We're gonna be dealing with that in a moment. I'd like to upgrade those. Also, our handlebars are tweaked. They're bent back just a little bit. I tried not to touch anything before I went up to the Poconos to ride this thing because I wanted to do it with you guys. The only thing I did do was I changed the oil and it really wasn't that bad. I'd also like to switch out this stock exhaust, upgrade the carburetor, and we'll see if we can make this notchy shifting any better. And believe it or not, I do have some hop-ups for this thing. All of these boxes right here are for the Lakota. Now, before we get started, let's take a look at our spread. These are all the parts that we're gonna be putting on this Lakota today. We'll start over here. We've got our aftermarket carburetor. This is for a Mojave. Uh, from what I uh, remember, this is a 34 millimeter carburetor and uh, it's a direct swap for the 32 millimeter that's on the Lakota. It's supposed to give it a little bit better power. We've got our jets over here so we can dial that bad boy in. We've got the knife, uh, you know, just in case. Uh, this did come with a, an intake port too, or a boot rather to fit that carburetor on there so we shouldn't have to stretch the old one. We've got some ODI grips. We'll get rid of those kind of tacky and outdated looking bar ends. And uh, it's just always good to put new grips and stuff on. And up here we've got our little cover. This is for the back. This is brand new from Kawasaki. I kind of cut it out of the bag, I have the part number here. It's pretty cool opening some of this stuff. This is the, these are the straps for it. Um, you can see the, the label is kind of yellowed. It's neat to open this stuff up because it's, I'm sure this is new old stock. And uh, it makes you wonder when these parts were actually packaged up. It may have been, you know, I don't know, 2005, 2004, 2003, when these things were being made. Um, it's just, it's just, it's kind of neat with these OEM parts. And then uh, we got the twin air, air filter. We'll swap out the air filter, just basic maintenance. I've got some Kawasaki KPO oil and an oil filter. Now I already did do the oil change. I just put that up here though, because that is one of the things that we did. Then we've got the cover for the uh, rear compartment. Uh, that's a nice little compartment back there. Those come in handy, especially for a quad like, you know, this is something that, uh, it's not like a racing quad or anything. It's something that more of like a, a friend would use or something. And you never know, like zip ties, flashlight. There's all kinds of stuff you can put in there. And then just got like the straps and stuff for that. Nothing really exciting. I've got a 13 tooth sprocket for, um, I don't know why I got this. 
Uh, I think this is for the blaster. And then moving on, we have uh, two things in boxes here. We're gonna open these up in a minute. Uh, these are brand new warning labels. Uh, this is one of those things that's like, why Why the hell would you buy this? I'll look at the date on it, 8 22 what's that say, 6? 6 2022 so this is not new old stock. That's probably because they use the same labels on their new stuff. Uh, but you can see the old one has got a nice crack in it, and it just kind of looks lousy. It's right there in your face. I don't like removing them, especially when you have like this kind of raised portion, then it looks like something's missing. So I'd rather just put the new one there. And I even got the Kawasaki rivets and the little washers that go on there. Even though I have these by like the hundreds, I've never actually ordered like a Kawasaki or a Yamaha one. And they were so cheap, I just wanted to see if, you know, there was anything special about the rivets. And uh, I don't think there is. And then we've got that big box back there, and that has something from DG. You guys can probably figure out what that is. We will be putting that on today, and we'll be listening to it. I'm super excited. And then uh, we've got these Kenda tires down here. And believe it or not, that is four whole tires smashed down. I posted pictures of those tires on Instagram and I got comments of people saying, can you make a video, how to install smashed tires, smushed tires? Because uh, the more and more tires that I've received, it doesn't matter the company, uh, they, a lot of times they come smashed like that and they can be really hard to see on the bead. I've got some decent techniques. Sometimes they really are just a pain in the ass. There's like nothing you can do. Um, I've even gone to tire shops uh, with my buddy, Matt, and uh, you know we struggle together. We got like the uh, the big the big cheater thing that blows air in there and kind of expands the tire. And sometimes even then they don't want to seat. So uh, we'll, we'll I'll show you some of my techniques. I'm sure we'll get them on there today. But uh, let's get started. All right, let's get started with something really easy so that we can get some progress right off the bat. Because if you don't have progress right away, it can be very demoralizing. And then you may quit and never come back. So what I've chosen to do are the handlebars. Now I had mentioned when I was writing this video, they're, they're pulled back a little bit. So probably just an adjustment we need. And the problem is already this quad is pretty small. And when they're pulled back, it makes them bend down. And when you turn, you see it actually hits my leg here. And so like you're turning and like right there, it's like hit my leg. And if you're trying to lean, that's not good, man. So if we tilt these bars up, that should give us a little bit more clearance. And then it won't do that because that is just really uncomfortable. We'll adjust our levers and stuff like that. Just get the ergonomics down right, put on some new grips and make this thing feel good. Now up front, we've got this big jumble of wires and stuff and a little plastic dash. It's got our neutral light and a reverse light. So I imagine if we pop this off, we'll have access to our clamps. Just have to loosen them up, bend the bars to where we want, and then we can tighten them back up. I wouldn't be surprised if these are maybe slightly loose and that's why they got pulled back the way that they are. Or maybe somebody just adjusted them that way. It's possible they like them pulled back. Don't know. That wasn't too bad. See, it's all dirty and dusty under there. Now, even though these bars are straight, I would typically upgrade the handlebars, especially if they're stock like this. Uh, stock bars like this tend to want to bend if you roll. I mean, all handlebars do, but uh, stock ones, like especially without the crossbar, definitely. Um, but this is going to be for the top quad series and we want all of the machines to be relatively stock. So if I was going to get a set of bars for this, it would probably just be some tusk bars or something with a crossbar, but basically they'd be exactly the same. I've decided I'm just going to reuse these because they're nice bars. Man, these things are like oxidized on there. Oh man, there we go. Now that already it feels it just feels like a bigger quad it's further forward and it's higher up and see now it doesn't hit my knee that's much much better then i'm going to tighten these down to 14 foot pounds now we're going to adjust our levers and everything before we do that though i think we'll switch out the grips i'm hoping that these bar ends and grips come off without too much difficulty i'm not really sure why they put these on here these are heavy man I know like on motorcycles, these weights kind of like help with the feel and balance, but man, these, this has to weigh like a pound. I wonder if this is the original grip. I'd be willing to bet that it is. Let's move this switch set over. Let's see if we can get some air under the grip. Sometimes that gets them right off. If it's an original grip, it might be stuck on there pretty good. We're gonna switch out these Phillips heads while we're at it because they're actually pretty jimmied up. Can always just cut these off, but kind of want to resell these, you know? 
All right, we've resorted to cutting these off anyways. Trying to cut these right down the center so I can glue them back together to uh, resell them. Victory. It's still in great shape too. All right, we'll repair this with some uh, glue. Uh, should be basically, guy, most guys do this, so, um, this, this is, this is basically, basically a new grip, so we'll just glue that up, and then this stuff dries clear, so you really, you really won't even know about it. All right, now these grips that we're gonna be installing are lock-ons, they're ODI, ODI lock-on grips. Um, these are not going to slide over the bars with all this gunk on here. This is what's left from those grips. That's typically what happens when you, when you, when you have uh, grips that were glued on. So I guess uh, you, know, you could scrape that uh, all night long and it would be a pain in the ass. I've used uh, Brilla pads on, on the die grinder. I've got this pad here. I've actually never used it before. I'm gonna try it out. If this doesn't work, we'll, we'll use the Brilla pad, but a lot of times stuff like this, we'll just get that stuff right off. It's like a really abrasive, almost plastic. We're gonna try not to make a huge mess here. Oh yeah, it, it, this literally, it takes it right off. And if you're really gentle with it, I'm gonna try not to go down to the paint because this it, these are steel bars. I think they are anyways, so they would rust. But we'll just get all this junk off and the grip should slide right on. Works great. It looks like it's coming off real easy, like you'd just be able to scratch it, but if you've ever messed with this stuff, it's a pain in the ass getting that off. This, this tool is just making it so easy. I'll give this a shot. Perfect. And I'll set our ODI grips up really easy. They've got these little bar end things. They're universal. It doesn't matter which side you put them on. And they clip in place. That one went on pretty easy. Just make sure that's snapped all the way on there. Looks good. Okay. That one looks good too. Then we've got these two little Allen screws. I like to get these started first. And I put just a little bit of Loctite on there. A little bit of blue Loctite, very small amount, just because you don't want these backing out. And don't tighten it down, just get them in there. And then we've got these little end plates. These are gonna snap in place just before we tighten down the outside clamp. All right, so this will just slide into place like so. You don't need any grip glue or anything with these. Make sure we have enough room for that uh, end clamp or uh, cap. It'll pop in like so. Here it snap like that. And then when we tighten this down, that shouldn't go anywhere. Now I'll get these set to where I like them, and then I'll tighten them down. Now that I've got the bars and the grips set, I can set up my switches and everything to make them nice and ergonomic where I like them. You can see right here, there's like a little raised section, and then there was a hole in the bars, and that raised section would go in the bars so that this doesn't spin. It's actually not a bad idea, but I don't think we're ever gonna use stock bars on this thing again. So we're gonna take a burr and smooth that over because it wasn't sitting flush on the bars because of it. And this brake, we're actually gonna have to work on because this is doing this weird thing I noticed. <laughs> when I went to get it the last time, it had been sitting for a couple weeks and it didn't wanna move. And even right now, this the pressure on this master cylinder is crazy. It seems to be affected with the temperature. And uh, like right now, you can barely even push the thing because there's so much pressure in the system. So I think uh, we just have, we'll probably just flush the fluid and it should be okay. And uh, we're gonna clean out this sight glass too because that is really, really yellow and it looks like shit. All right, now let's get one more small victory before we move on to doing these tires because I'm not looking forward to doing that. Let's do this little compartment back here. That should be a really easy job. And check this out, guys. The parking brake is not on. And look how much pressure 
My whole body weight is leaning on this. That's how hard it is to turn this thing right now. Now, it wasn't like that when we did the initial test drive, so it's not like, oh my gosh, when you fix those brakes, this thing's gonna be so fast. I think it will be a little bit faster. I do think it'll free up, make it roll a little bit better, but it's not gonna be like crazy, but we can't have this going on, especially um, I noticed the longer that you ride it, the worse it gets. Definitely a fluid related issue. But anyways, here's our little compartment back here. We could take this off and remove this metal bracket, save a little bit of weight. Uh, but again, we're not really modifying these machines too much for the series. We want them to be mostly like how they were when they were new and stock, you know, with the exception of, you know, the exhaust system we're gonna put on and stuff like that. Um, just like basic mods that a lot of people would typically have. Uh, but this container, these are really handy. It should be waterproof. It has like a little rubber gasket that goes around the outside. And there's two little stages in there. You can put like tools on one, one, one half, something on the other half. Kind of a, uh, a very primitive design here. It's got uh, like a band and you just wrap these, the little circle thing around both halves. That holds it in place. I could see how these things would get lost. I would imagine probably uh, any Lakota that you go to look at, it's probably missing this, especially because this band, I'm sure dry rots uh, over time, it pops off and then who the hell knows where it went. Now I've got this cover as well, but it looks like we've got two fasteners right here to take the plastics off and we do have to take those off to get to the carburetor and exhaust. So we'll save that for later. And now for the dreaded tires. I love changing tires by hand. I love it. <laughs> uh, we'll see if we can get this thing on the stand. This quad is really heavy. It, I think it weighs like 440 or 460 pounds out of the box. And as I'm working with it, I'm noticing lots of like, I don't want to say unnecessary, but they are like, it's stuff that you don't usually see on sport quads. Uh, like odd little guards and kind of extra things, things that might make things uh, like convenient, like the little carry box and metal brackets seem to be really beefy and whatnot, but uh, I bet you we could lose like, like I'm gonna say 20 to 30 pounds really easily just by shaving some of this stuff off. I mean, check this out. These are the bar ends from the handlebars and that alone right there is almost a pound. Just unnecessary stuff and you know, when you have a ton of it, it all starts to add up. You got mud flaps, shit like that. And uh, then you end up with a 460 pound machine. Look at this, man. <laughs> there is no parking brake on right now. That is not good. These are also steel wheels. That's another heavy aspect of this thing. All right, let's first get this old tire off. These are actually pretty nice tires, but we're all running Kenta tires for the Top Quad series. That way we have an equal playing field because not everybody's uh, four-wheeler had nice tires. So we're gonna let the air out here, just pull the valve stem. Made in USA. How often do you see that anymore? All right, now we're going to be breaking the bead and pulling these tires off manually, which I love doing. Uh, this is a great tool though. I, I don't think I could do it without this. It's a bead breaker. It's really simple. I've used it on some really old, crusty rims, old tires. Uh, these could actually be difficult. Uh, highly recommend this tool though. By looking at the code here on the tire, I do believe these were manufactured in 2002. So these are probably the original tires, which is incredible. This thing had to have been kept inside a lot, or at least not in the sun, because there's no dry rot on these. That, that's just very surprising. This is a 21 year old tire um, and a four, -wheel, four wheeler tire at that. So anyways, let's see if this will break the bead, but a lot of times these old tires, it doesn't matter the condition, uh, they just don't want to come off the bead, but we'll see. Got these like height things here. Lower it a little bit. Boom, this one came right off. And there you go, bead is broken. You can see how easy that is. This is another one of those uh, things. It looks really easy. I'm doing this right now. I'm, people probably like, oh, why don't you just like stand on the tire? or like run it over with your truck. I've, believe me, I used to do some really unorthodox methods to get tires off and it's just not worth it. Uh, but if you have something like this, it just makes it so easy. Uh, like I said, highly recommend. I'll break the other side. Boom, they're actually, it's usually not this easy. This must be like a two ply tire or something. Sometimes you have to roll it, there you go. Both beads are broken. All right, now we're done. What I would say is the easiest part. And uh, now we have to wrestle this damn tire off. 
Uh, judging by how easy that bead broke, I think this one won't be too bad, uh, but we're gonna do it with the old school method. We've got tire spoons, we've got these two skinny Motion Pros, and then these are just old school tie rod, tie, um, tire spoons. You can get these ones like this off Amazon really cheap. And then you need to have the, uh, the bear blankie. It's got You need the bear blankie or it's just not gonna work. Uh, for real though, this thing is really nice to put down for two reasons. Uh, one, depending on the surface you're working on for the tiles, they wanna slide around. If you're working on blacktop and you're wrestling and stuff, you wanna try to save your finish as much as possible. So if you put a mat down, at least it won't be like rubbing against gravel or something like that. And then I've also got WD-40 on hand. Sometimes this can ease um, slipping the tire over the rim, but you don't always need it. Uh, so we're working with the front of the rim. What you do is you push one half of the tire down and then you can push that tire kind of into that, like the, the belly and it moves it over. So get our spoon in here and then see the whole tire kind of like moved over. And we'll just roll it over. Unfortunately, somebody painted these rims. They did a decent job, but these are probably gonna get chipped up pretty good. If I really wanted to preserve this, I put tape around the rim. And then once I have those two spoons in there, I'll take the mini spoon and just take little bits. And walk it around. It's nice to have four spoons. You don't need four spoons. Um, I just find that it's easier with four spoons. And take your time when you do this because I've already tried to take like two big of chunks <laughs> and the tie rod like slips. <laughs> And, and hits you in the neck or something. <laughs> and uh, it can just make for a bad day. So you can see it's not that hard. You just gotta take your time. It's like our rim uh, semi survived. This spray paint is just kind of chipping right off. Now for this back side, we're gonna take a spoon and we're gonna put it in here. Get the top started like that. And now you can use your body. And we're just gonna kinda like peel the tire away from the rim. The thicker the ply of tire, the more difficult this is gonna be. Pretty much got this one. All right. It wasn't that bad. The, the rim doesn't look bad. There's like little chips and stuff. You can see where the tool was dragging. That's another thing. Like if you have, if you've got brand new rims or nice rims, I would just take them to a tire shop, dude. I would, uh, most of the time though, when I'm, when I'm taking rims off, I'm, I'm gonna get them uh, repowder coated or something like that. And uh, in this case, these, this is not a perfect machine. So it's okay that it has little nicks and stuff in the, in the rim. All right, now here's our new rims. <laughs> New tires, and this is how they come, man. Believe it or not, this is two tires sm smash together. So if, uh, if you don't know what you're doing, these can be a freaking nightmare to seat. So you may get the tire on the rim and then you're just out of luck. Look at this one, man. <laughs> I don't even know. All right, now depending on what kind of tires you're working with, they may be directional. These are directional. You can see the tire is like totally inside out. Um, so what I like to try to do is, as my, I mean, literally the beads are touching each other. <laughs> so I like to try to, you know, pop these out as much as possible. This is really, this is pretty tight. <sighs> Before putting the tire on, that's gonna help out a little bit usually. Wow, look at that, dude. This is a majorly deformed tire. Isn't it amazing? That, that's how they come though, man. And then when they're mounted up and uh, there's a little bit of ride time on them, they, they're totally normal. <laughs> I don't blame them either because shipping this stuff is super expensive. Okay, so, man, what a weird looking tire in that shape. So then what I wanna do is find the side that I feel is more rigid and isn't going to turn inside out. And I think it's gonna be this side. And it's also, it's gotta be uh, the right direction. Since this is the first wheel, 
it doesn't matter, we can put it either way. Um, I'm actually gonna choose the harder way because uh, both of these tires are bellied in the same direction. So we'll do the harder one first. One of them is gonna be harder. <laughs> Before you mount up your tire, it's a good idea to clean the inner bead because you can get leaks there and now's the easiest time to do it. So I just take a red Scotch-Brite and just kind of make sure there's no debris. If you have any nicks in the wheel, stuff like that, you can get them out like a file. Okay, so I've chosen my side. I'm gonna take my WD-40. Uh, I used to use soap and WD-40 works so much better. It's like not even funny. Uh, you can use as much oil as you want. I'll flip it over and I'm gonna get that oil all over the rim. I want that to be nice and slippery. And now usually you can just smash this on, but when you have the inside out tires, sometimes you can't because they wanna go back to being inside out again. Sometimes you can put your hands inside and put pressure there. It really becomes like a game of finesse. I don't really have any techniques that are like, this is gonna work every time. You just gotta kinda work it. And we can use, we can use the irons if we have to, but if you can walk it on without using them, you wanna try to do that first. And throw in some, some gloves so that I don't get oil on my whoop. Some people were asking what this is. It's like a thing that monitors my heart rate and my sleep and shit like that. And I did discover my sleep was incredibly bad. Really bad. There we go. All right, we got one on. And for the top, we're gonna use spoons. I love changing tires by hand, what about you? Oh, How would anybody do this? We can go to a tire shop and get it done for 20 bucks. I don't know. All right, now this, I'm gonna see if we can pop this out. Uh, usually by grabbing the knobbies. If we can pop this one out, this one won't be an issue. I can pretty much guarantee. I can pretty much guarantee. All right, screw it. I was supposed to show you how to do a messed up tire anyways. We're gonna try the ether technique and see if it'll get that uh, dent out. I've got a blanket right there because sometimes um, the, thing, the tire with the fire won't go out. So uh, you put the, the blanket on top to smother it. And uh, we've got starting fluid right there, ether, any kind of starting fluid is gonna work in a lighter. And then uh, what I like to do is get air pressure ready to rock and roll because if it's not uh, ready, once the, the reaction happens, a lot of times the tire fills up. And then uh, if you don't get air in it fast enough, you, uh, you lose everything, you, you gotta do it over again. That, that was a terrible explanation. And uh, let's just do this. So we're gonna spray in around the rim. You don't wanna put too much because this shit will explode. And then we're gonna put a trail and then light it up. It didn't work. You wanna make sure, geez, this thing is still going. Shit, this is pretty bad. You also wanna make sure that you have a, uh, a towel that isn't like soaked in gas or anything like that, cause that would be bad. Let's try it on this side. There was the reaction, but it wasn't enough. Now, if you guys haven't seen this before, you're probably scratching your head, wondering what I'm doing lighting this tire on fire. This is what's supposed to happen. This is known as the ether trick, the gas trick, the explosion trick. I've heard it called a number of things. Basically what's going on here, when the starting fluid ignites, the gases expand extremely fast and that forces the bead of the tire up against the rim. So it just causes a, a very fast expansion of the gases and that usually seats the bead. Now, because that bent in section is so rigid, uh, we're having some trouble here, but let's give it a couple more goes. And if that doesn't work, we're gonna have have to try to pry that part of the tire out. 
I want to stop to thank you guys for making it this far into the video. I also wanted to remind you guys that this Lakota is going to be in a top quad series against the Yamaha Blaster, the Honda 300EX, and the Polaris Trailblazer. We're going to be putting these machines head to head, and it's going to be a really fun series. If you're not familiar with what top quad is, it's where I get together with other creators and we put machines head to head. Let me know in the comment section below which quad you think will be the fastest. And in the meantime, make sure to check out series one and series two of top quad. And if you're enjoying this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing for more content like this. All of the tools and products in this video will be listed in the description below. All right, guys, let's get back to the video. All right, it's getting kind of cold here, guys. We're in like the mid twenties. Let's try this one more time. I'm gonna try a different technique. I'm gonna try to actually get more of the fluid in the tire. Usually I don't have to do this. I just kind of jet it around the bead and enough gets in there that it's effective. But this is a different job. This is serious. <clears throat> oh, come on, you Oh, what the I didn't even get it. What the hell, man? Whoa! Well, that was much, that, that was much better than the last times. <clears throat> At least we had a good reaction. This tire is stubborn though, man. Whew. What the hell? We'll try it one more time. We gotta get this thing. We gotta get it. All right, this has to work. If it doesn't, I don't know. Oh, I don't know, man. That might be it. We gotta try to get this damn thing. Let's see if we can fold this, get this damn crease out. Maybe now that the tire is a little bit warmer and soft, this will pop out. It's just really hard to grab onto these knobbies and get any kind of leverage. I feel like that almost might be sealed. Let me try something here. This might be the worst tire. Oh. Oh my God, I think we got it. We got it. Now really I should put oil on that bead, but I don't want to let the pressure out of this. We got it. Yeah! <laughs> Amazing. I don't know if you guys can see, but the bead is not seated. That's like, uh, you always got to check because it can fool you. I've already put rims on before and uh, I didn't realize that the rim wasn't seated because the, the, you know, the bulging part of the tire was actually touching the rim, but the bead wasn't seated. And um, <laughs> sometimes they hold air that way, but, and then you ride around and they eventually seat, but uh, now I really like to get them on there. So put oil around the bead. Again, this won't hurt anything. I actually think it's good to do this. I think it just makes for a better seal. I'll put it on both sides. Yeah, this side. I don't know if we're really gonna get any oil in there. It looks like it's seated pretty well. We're at 17 pounds. You don't wanna go too crazy high. 25 pounds. Oh, there we go. We get it all the way. I can see it's still not on over here. Maybe it is. Still not seated. That's all right. I'm gonna put the uh, Schrader valve in there. There's a bunch of techniques for getting the bead to seat. You can fill it up with air and bounce the tire, stuff like that. Uh, sometimes just leaving the tire overnight with air in it or riding on the tire can seat the bead. But ideally, we wanna get it on there uh, first before we even go riding. I can't believe that's not seated. Better be a damn good tire when it's done. All right, let's oil this real good with the tire laying down so that oil seeps in there. Woo! Oh shit! Dude. 
That's gotta be one of the, the loudest bead poppings I've ever had here. <laughs> Hot damn. And it's not deformed anymore, look at that. It's a good looking tire. Jeez. Now I'm not filming that three more times, so I'm gonna do the tires on my own. But the moral of the story is, I don't have some magic solution to seat the bead of squish tires. They're all kind of their own animal. I've done quite a few of these now, and uh, sometimes they go on no problem, other times they're like this one. But I will tell you, if I didn't have the techniques that I've learned you know, over the years, it probably would have been maybe even impossible. And most importantly, if you know somebody with a tire machine, or you have a local shop, just have them do it and save yourself the headache. Now, I'm not gonna leave you totally in the dark on these back tires. These ones uh, are proving to be a serious pain in the ass. Damn. Hmm. So I wanted to show you guys, I have two sets of ratchet straps around here and it's helping to, I put it on the, the two raised lumps. Without those straps on there, this is what the tire goes back to, which is like impossible. <laughs> I tried to do um, <laughs> a thing of ether and it was a total fail. Oh man. <laughs> All right. We failed. <laughs> so with this, um, at least we're getting close. And in fact, before I even do another shot of ether, it's looking like we're, we're, we're so close to touching the rim that maybe we could get air. We might've got it. No. But it looks, I think we can, I think we can get this without doing the ether. Ah, oh, dude, it's freaking freezing out. It's too cold and windy. Oh no, come on. Oh, I think we, oh no, man, we're so close. Ah. Oh. We absolutely cannot let this tire win, dude. Oh, there's just no way. I really hope the other ones are easier. Oh. Weak. That was weak. All right, I think we can actually do this without the ether if we get this strapped up right. It's just too cold to be outside right now. Dude, this is ridiculous. If anybody was ever like, hey Mike, I'll pay you $50,000 to install a set of tires for me. I'd be like, F you. <laughs> Actually, I'd take the $50,000 and then take the tires right to a tire shop <laughs> and pay that guy 25 grand and keep the other 25. A few minutes later. We got it. Oh. Oh, we got it. <laughs> I, like, I was at that point where I was like, just thinking it was never gonna happen. Man, that was... I don't know if it's because it's so cold out or what, but this was a tough set of tires. It really was. So what did we learn? We learned that you should just take the tires to a tire shop 
and make them do it for $20. <laughs> It's kind of sad, man. Uh, a little, little embarrassing, but it took almost six hours for me to do these damn tires. Now, uh, I would say dismounting took about 45 minutes. That really wasn't that bad. Uh, but mounting up these squished tires, this was the worst set that I've ever had. And maybe it wasn't six hours, uh, but it was close. It was way more time than it should have taken. And, uh, you know, each and every one of these smashed tires, uh, like I said before, I don't really have like a solid method that it's like, oh, do this. And that's how you do it. Each one of these is like its own animal. Uh, even doing some of the tires that uh, I didn't, I did off camera, uh, like this side. This side took like two hours, but I used different techniques to get them on and stuff. So it's really, you really, you just got to have some finesse. And um, if I didn't have the experience from doing multiple other sets, I bet you I couldn't have even gotten these tires on. So I, I would just take them to a tire shop. I think that's the way to go. Uh, one of the other things that happened, if you look at this stud right here, this stud was bent. Uh, so I guess they like smashed into a rock sideways or something, and it was bent a little bit. And it was a nightmare getting the old lug nut off of there. And uh, luckily I managed to salvage enough threads and I could shave down the bent portion and we're good there. But it took a little bit of time just getting that old wheel off. Now somebody did have a really good idea. I posted a picture of this about halfway through the job and somebody said, take a large inner tube, stuff it inside the squished tire, inflate it, that'll you know separate the walls and then leave it in the sun and it'll kind of take that form. And I think that part of the problem is that it is so cold out right now. Those tires have been smashed for so long and they just didn't want to reform. So they just kept wanting to squish back together every time I would pull them back apart. Now that is a great idea, but when you're, you know, in a rush or something, you know, if you're a tire shop or something, you know, you can't be, you know, sitting, sometimes you got customers waiting around, or if you're like me and you just want to get the job done, you're not going to have that option. So uh, but that is a really good idea. If it's just like something that you have to do the job yourself, I would definitely consider uh, that the inner tube method. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Crazy how, how much time that took. Putting those tires on took a lot longer than expected, so we're gonna move the rest of this project into a second video, but before I let you guys go, I can't, I can't leave you guys hanging. We're gonna do, uh, we'll open up this exhaust. I wanna check this thing out. I've been waiting forever to see this thing too, uh, so I haven't even opened this up. I ordered this directly from DG. Uh, I couldn't find it anywhere else. There was a website that I found, if you guys remember the original video, where I was uh, picking out products for the Lakota, and that just, um, though that company never followed through. They actually never responded or anything. Um, they, they didn't respond to my email, they don't answer their phone, and they left me on red on Facebook. So uh, I'm guessing that they're out of business. I don't know, but <laughs> hopefully I get my money back for that one. And then this one came directly from DG. And I guess it's, I don't know, been two months. I honestly, I thought maybe this one wouldn't come either. I was gonna get the dreaded uh, discontinued product message. So we have this pack really nice. This looks like the header here. So this is a full system. It looks pretty thick. The uh, the OEM one is like really thin, so that should that should definitely help with performance. And then here's the silencer. That's pretty awesome, dude. This is like yet again another product that I feel like is from the past. Although I would bet you they just made this. They probably didn't have any of these things on hand. If they did, they probably would have shipped it right away. But it's been so long. I I, I imagine that they they fabricated this specifically for this order, and I wouldn't be surprised if they took the listing down, because I can't imagine. When do you guys think the last DG Lakota 300 exhaust was ordered? I don't know. All right, so we got our header here. This is my first new DG exhaust. It's pretty nice. Everything feels really nice and solid. Heavy. It's not a... Some of these exhausts are like super lightweight. It almost feels like they're chintzy, but it's probably just the materials. And over here we've got some kind of information. I wonder if they've got recommended jetting on here. There it says, packaged by David. Ah, uh, <laughs> 1323. So they definitely, they didn't make this until way late. So I ordered this quite a while ago. Let's check out the good part. Oh my God, are you serious? And this is a heavy duty muffler. Uh, when we take the stock one off, we'll have to weigh them side by side and compare them. But uh, I guess this is sort of like a megaphone design. It's not quite like the Super Trap, I don't think, the design, but it's close. And from what I understand, these are pretty damn loud. I'm actually over the super loud exhaust thing and I'm coming to appreciate the deep, mellow, like powerful tone of exhaust. 
But um, the hopefully it's not as loud as the people online say, but you never know what they're exposed to. If it's somebody at the racetrack, they probably think this is quiet. If it's somebody who's riding stock machines all the time, they're like, oh, this the DJ system is super loud. So it'll be interesting to see. We'll do that in the next video. I love all you guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more content like this, please consider hitting that subscribe button. If you're looking to help out the channel even more, there is the option to join all channel members, get guaranteed responses to their YouTube comments. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace out.